I'd like to extend a very warm welcome to everyone who's joined us online for Henley & Partners 16th Annual Global Citizenship Conference. My name's Juliette Foster and it gives me great pleasure to introduce our esteemed guest, the Swiss-German economist and leading migration expert, Professor Thomas Straber. Now, Dr Straber is a professor for international economic relations at the University of Hamburg and he joins us today to discuss the geopolitics and economics of migration and mobility. So welcome, thank you so much for being here. Let's start with the context. Where are the largest refugee flows occurring and which countries are hosting the most number of displaced people? Of course, all over the world, uh, migration and uh, also refugee movements have gained attention in the last uh, years. Of course, uh, specifically in the last couple of months, the Ukraine war has even increased uh, the uh, moments of uh, refugee movements. And uh, before it was the, let's say, area around the Mediterranean Sea that um, a lot of people from the Near East have moved towards uh, Europe, from Northern Africa towards uh, Southern Europe, and then to move further towards uh, Northern uh, Europe. So the largest uh, flows in the last years, of course, come from um, war areas like Syria, uh, Iraq, Afghanistan, but also from uh, movements of rather poorer people from uh, Africa up north. How do you see this migration pattern progressing in 2023? Do you see it altering radically in any way? Do you see the numbers perhaps stabilising or indeed getting worse? I'm afraid that uh, it will go on and probably even in a more extensive way as in the past, but due to the fact that um, uncertainty is still rising worldwide, political pressure is going on uh, also in Europe. Uh, and I think as long as the Ukraine uh, crisis is uh, still going on, we will have a further movement of people through uh, Eastern Europe towards uh, West. Um, and also the uh, area of uh, the Near East um, is uh, still under pressure uh, politically, economically, socially. And so I'm afraid that uh, the next year we'll see even uh, further uh, progress in uh, refugee movements, in migration pressure. And um, so the need for having uh, also good policy action is uh, still increasing. Given what you've just said, what I'd like to focus on now is the response, because typically we find with EU governments and indeed governments elsewhere, the reaction to these population movements is to erect barriers or indeed embrace other measures to keep refugees out of their countries. But how much is that costing? I'm afraid that uh, it is still very costly and um, the costs are even uh, becoming higher and higher due to the fact that migration is an issue that is uh, has an international global scale and most reactions uh, against migration flows or against free migration flows are national and the discrepancy between global sources and global determinants and national reactions has increased in the last year so it becomes more and more costly to have national policies against the global phenomenon. The reality is that Population movements caused by conflict are one of the key defining themes of the 21st century, but the, the response of many governments is ultimately quite weak. So given that and where we are, do you sense any sign that in the case of Europe, there could be some sort of a move towards the idea of a common migration and refugee policy? Is that where the debate is likely to go or is it still moribund in, in that particular area? It's definitely even more serious that um, national migration policies move towards a European scale, because this is a like let's say a contradiction in itself to have a national welfare state and somehow a common um, economic area as we do in uh, Europe, and then you have free movements between the different members of the European Union. On the other hand, you have not free access to the social welfare states of the different um, areas and uh, members of the EU. So the need to have a common migration policy is still increasing. And I think that um, 
probably the, in the last years, also the political will and the awareness that we have somehow to move within an integrated economic area towards a common migration policy has risen. So I'm optimistic that with regard to the increasing need, there will be an increasing will to overcome the challenges. What is the economic case for an arrangement like this, a common migration and refugee policy? If you had to build the case, what is it? My favourite is to have a common European framework to set the rules on an economic scale and then to leave execution of these rules to national bodies, to national agencies, to national, let's say, um, also culture or uh, goals or aims that should be reached with a national kind of execution of global common European rules. And this setting of the rules should go towards first having a common rule and execute it on a national way with the freedom to adapt these rules to national circumstances. And aside from filling labour gaps, what are the other key economic benefits that refugees or migrants bring with them? And how could Europe leverage that in times of crisis to help it power forward? Almost every country in the European Union is affected by demographic change, the aging of the population. That means that uh, there is a need for further uh, workforce for more labor to come and to make use out of it, uh, whatever the need for a certain area is. And um, I think this is a definitive uh, um, benefit of um, having migration flows towards uh, Europe. Um, then, of course, um, diversity is an issue that has an increased um, value in the let's say also diverse um, uh, work uh, framework of the 21st century. So having more diverse answers to more diverse challenges. So that is the second one. And the third one is of course, how to improve new technologies. And there it is also uh, sometimes in, uh, at least in history, it was the case that uh, by having immigrants, they bring in new skills, new knowledge, new ideas. And I think these are, is on the benefit side. On the other hand, you have integration costs. And if we are talking about the refugees that come from rather far away um, with a long distance in, in many regards from, from language uh, till um, technological um, abilities to, to handle certain technologies that are country specific. So these are the integration costs that have to be balanced against the benefits. And I think this is why I'm asking for a common European migration policy. You are gonna distribute somehow in a fair way um, the, the, the outcome of this uh, balancing process. Earlier, you referenced burden sharing. In other words, the cost from integrating refugees. How can Europe equally distribute those costs in a way that's politically acceptable and which also convinces a skeptical public that it's worth it? That is indeed the $1 million question and it is not easy at all to answer it because um, as you said, is this um, economically speaking, for me as an economist, it, it, it rather looks uh, simple to balance somehow costs and benefits, but um, already the definition, what is a cost and what is a benefit from migration um, differs from culture to culture, from country to country, from person to person. So this is a rather normative decision, even if we are gonna calculate it in a very quantitative um, manner. So, um, and then of course, burden sharing means that you have to convince um, in Europe, 27 countries that somehow this is a good idea and that the winners or the people that are going to think that they may benefit from one or the other uh, solution are going to compensate the so-called losers uh, for the benefits they do and get and earn. And so I think, um, as you said, this is uh, not at all simple. Actually, the European Union is going to try to find and to define a common migration policy since a 
couple of decades already, and they were not successful because when you are going to deal with the issues of migration and integration, it is not just an economic uh, question in the pure economic sense of costs and benefits and monetary outcomes. It is a it is the question who belongs to us, uh, who is a member of our uh, community of, of of states of nation states that are gonna offer um, welfare, uh, social um, welfare to the citizens. And so the question who is a member and who is allowed to be a member and how could we become a member of a community, of a country, of a club? This is the interesting question. And of course, um, the answer again uh, differs from country to country. And there I'm afraid um, this will be a, a long lasting discussion. But as I've said before, I'm optimistic that we are on the way to deal with these questions because it is more urgent than ever before to find common European solutions. And clearly a radical approach is required given what lies further down the road. But would you say that Euroscepticism in some countries is one potential obstacle that's perhaps preventing governments from adopting a constructive alternative approach towards the refugee situation? This is uh, fully uh, correct what you are asking. I mean, we see it um, in many other sectors and fields and challenges of the future that uh, in, in these days, in these um, uncertain days about um, how the future will change uh, the framework of living, the conditions of living, welfare issues, um, what we what we actually see, and this is, a, let's say, the basics of uh, your question is that um, we see a kind of renationalization, a, a deglobalization, uh, an increasing uh, uh, the, the the swing it swing nationalism is swinging back and comes back into let's say politics and more and more countries also within Europe um, are going to look for their national interests and they think what I'm think is wrong but the belief is that um, that all these uh, challenges uh, migration inflation. Um, crisis, uh, catastrophes, and whatever uh, is on the horizon, that we should that that that, that many governments, many populations uh, think that they should be um, uh, solved on a national scale, and that uh, by reconstructing national borders, this may help the the, the to find good solutions, and uh, this is uh, makes uh, even if. Even if if economics would say are, you should gonna open up borders to to handle and to um, to to overcome these challenges, um, people this is a normal human reaction. They look what they know. They come to the neighborhood. They think that local solutions um, will fit better. That they search for national independence to to cut. Uh, global dependencies. And um, of course, this is also true with regard to the European dimension that um, they, they act rather national than European. Ultimately, the refugee issue can only really be resolved in the countries where it began, the crisis. Should European nations perhaps use additional measures like sanctions or perhaps economic incentives to encourage these governments to protect citizens who are vulnerable from persecution and thereby stop the flight from kicking in? With regard to this insight, we are on a very um, good way. I would say that in the last couple of years, um, from belief, it becomes reality that the Europeans have realized that the the most cheapest, the most effective, the most sustainable migration policy starts in the countries of origin by somehow having more positive outlooks to the future, more welfare, uh, and at least a feeling to the population that it improves, that standard of livings are going to improve, that for the kids and the kids to come, the living situation in the origin countries is going to improve. This is by far the most effective and for all people involved, um, most sustainable um, solution. And I think uh, this is now in the heads, in the brains of uh, the Europeans and 
I think that um, this is a common sense now that um, it is the best way to somehow, I wouldn't say sanctions as you asked, I would say to give incentives um, for good governance, for stable political, social uh, institutions that are going to stabilize societies, that are going to somehow decline incentives to move towards north. And of course, uh, this contradicts somehow and makes climate change even more important to the uh, trend that some areas, in some areas, uh, the climate change has already um, uh, 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 somehow um, worsened uh, the conditions of life and is a reason why people have to migrate just to survive. And um, so there at that point, migration policy goes parallel to the policy against um, climate change. And uh, the more, let's say, um, um, successful we are in uh, keeping down climate change, the more we are also going to do to lower migration pressure. Dr. Thomas Straubel, we have to leave it there, but thank you so much for all your time and, of course, your valuable contribution to this session of Henley and Partners 16th Annual Global Citizenship Conference in what has been an interesting and thought-provoking discussion. And a big thank you also to our global online audience. We appreciate your interest and your engagement.